Uh, greetings, all of you. John Roars here, uh, St. Andrew's Church for this Wednesday Reflection. Um, and as you know, that this past month, um, instead of doing kind of mini worship services on Wednesday, we offered um, some reflections. Andy shared some spiritual devotion uh, resources uh, throughout the month. Um, and we wanted to do something similar uh, here in September. Um, you know, it's such a such a stressful and busy time for many of us, um, you know, launching kids back into school, whatever that looks like. And um, we're, we're launching some new things at church and, and so forth. And so it seemed a good time to go back uh, to the basics. Um, and in September, for these Wednesday uh, reflections, I want to focus on uh, scripture, on the Bible, on uh, what, it, what the Bible is, what it means, um, how to read it. Um, what what um, influence and impact it has on our lives today, what the Bible says about God, about uh, Jesus, about ourselves. Um, so we're going to spend some weeks here uh, reflecting on uh, the Bible. Um, this is a Bible that I was given um, at my ordination, um, and it, we have a sort of a bookshelf. The top shelf is, is full of Bibles, and some of them are, are family Bibles that are heirlooms that we have, and Andy and I each have our, our ordination Bibles. Maybe you have a, a, a family Bible or a confirmation Bible or something at home in your house. Um, so gra grab it in these, uh, in these weeks ahead as you go through these Wednesday reflections with me and, um, and dig into it a little bit, and, and may that be an invitation to you. For today, I wanted to start really at the, the most basic level and, and, and say what, what's in the Bible? You know, what what, what comprises uh, the scripture that we, that we uh, use and, and um, to inform our faith in, in each week in the church? Um, and we'll, we'll carry on in subsequent weeks and take other, other aspects uh, of, that, of those questions. Um, so the first five books of the Bible um, we call the Pentateuch. Um, in, in Judaism, it's the Torah. Um, and those, of course, are, are Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they are the foundational stories of, of God's uh, relationship um, to the Hebrew people um, and God's special relationship with them and their journey um, into closer relationship uh, with God. And, and that, of course, as with any relationship, there are lots of ups and downs and twists and turns um, in those great foundational stories. Um, and many of the, 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 those first stories, um, of course, come out of their context in that Mesopotamian region. Um, so they, they, uh, those stories, many of them, are partially derived uh, from other uh, stories that were floating around that Middle Eastern uh, region at the time. So different, there were different stories about um, how the world was created, and uh, different stories about a great flood and a great uh, journey in, in that way. And, um, you know, lots of stories of miracles and, and healings and, and, uh, and so forth that, that become sort of adapted or interwoven into these stories specifically about God's uh, relationship uh, with the Hebrew people. Uh, so some of it is sort of history, and some of it is mythology, um, and, and, and that's all woven together. And if, 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 we, if we sort of parse it out looking always for what is true, for what really happened, um, first of all, you know, that's sort of an endless chase. There's no way always to know uh, what really happened. And, and second of all, we're kind of missing, missing the point of the stories um, which is that they have a truth with a capital T. You know, they always, they always contain a notion of truth about who we are and who God is um, in relationship to us. Um, so they're, they're the kind of true that, you know, the same way that maybe there's some stories that are handed down from generation in your family, and you don't know always if they really happen just that way, but, but they're still the stories that give meaning to your family's origin and, and your life together. Um, and that's kind of, in the same way, these early foundational stories um, are meant to be read. 
it's also the stories that contain the journey of, of uh, the Hebrew people into the promised land when they eventually become uh, the kingdom of Israel. Um, it's the stories uh, that contain um, uh, the giving of the law, which becomes so foundational to uh, Jewish faith and, and tradition um, and, and our inherited tradition as well. Um, now, beyond those first five books, we also have a, a set of history books, uh, the books of the kings and the books of chronicles. Um, the judges, uh, it kind of fits in that category more or less, and even some later books um, like, uh, like the book of Esther or the book of Maccabees contain um, some history as well, um, and some others. Samuel uh, is another one. Um, and so these are the books that, that contain... Um, sort of the rise of the kings in, in Israel and their experience and lots of ups and downs uh, with them as well. Um, and there again, there, there, there are multiple um, history books, sometimes with competing narratives and competing truths. Um, so there again, we're not, we're not needing to parse out exactly what happened, but get a, get a sense of the scope um, and the meaning behind many of those stories. Uh, what follows then is um, there's a set of uh, books uh, that, that we call wisdom literature. Uh, the Psalms um, and Proverbs uh, fit in that category. Uh, Ecclesiastes, um, you could probably call Job uh, sort of in its own category, but, but there's certainly wisdom to be derived there. And um, uh, the book of Ruth, maybe. Uh, you know, some of these are hard to categorize, but... Um, stories that contain um, sort of moral lessons or teaching, um, sometimes in, in the scope of a story and sometimes in lots of little uh, snippets um, uh, that, that are imparted um, that, that speak to our human experience and to um, who God is in, in, in relationship to us. Um, and, and many of those Psalms and, and Proverbs especially are used in, in, uh, in Job to some extent, used in our uh, liturgies. You see those passages come out um, in the liturgical expression of the church. Follows then is uh, uh, many books of, of prophets, both major and minor prophets. Um, and the stories of the prophets often come across as a critique of the people of Israel who had uh, lost their way in, in their relationship with God. They had strayed and were worshiping other idols. Um, or they had uh, prioritized their sort of um, religious expression and, and, and kind of the rigidity and formality of that over and against the, uh, their, their need and their command to serve the poor and to work for justice and, and peace and to care for the needy and so forth. Um, so there's this, this critique. And, and part of that arose from, from needing to make sense of the fact that they were conquered. I mean, there were, there were a series of invasions of the kingdom of Israel, and they were conquered and sent into exile. Um, so how to make sense of that? It felt like God had abandoned them. What had they done wrong? And the prophets, the answer that the prophets speak to is they had strayed from the ways of, of justice and compassion and caring for the least of these. Um, so that's sort of the message of the prophets, which, which still resonates uh, very much today and, and especially resonates in the Gospels. Jesus draws a lot uh, from Isaiah and some of the prophets in, in his teaching. Um, and then the, the, uh, what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures wrap, wraps up with some apocalyptic uh, literature that, that again will, will resonate um, in parts of the New Testament um, especially the book of Revelation, will draw back to the book of Daniel and, and others in, in, uh, in the end of the Hebrew Scriptures. So then we switch, of course, to, uh, to the New Testament. Um, we have the, the four Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, which are, uh, of course, the stories of Jesus' Jesus's life and death and resurrection um, told um, in in kind of different narratives and to different audiences, and they have different stories. There again, there are different versions of the same event and same story. Um, so we're looking for the, 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 the bigger truth 
uh, behind those stories um, and looking to see how how Jesus embodies God's love in the flesh um, and, and, and lives amongst us and, and spreads and shares that love out into the world in a revelatory way um, and in a way that um, provides the path of, of God's uh, dream for us and God's salvation of us. Um, so the stories of the Gospels, um, and we'll talk more about those in, in another week, uh, followed by the book of Acts, which is the history portion of, of the New Testament, the story of uh, the founding of the church, and, and then the, the expansion of the church into uh, broader parts of that region of the world. Um, and that story is also told through Paul's letters, Paul's letters to the different churches in the different cities uh, where those house churches were formed to begin to follow these teachings of Jesus um, in these small communities. And so Paul is corresponding with them and encouraging them and, and sometimes reprimanding them and, um, and, and sharing uh, his, his understanding of Jesus's life and teaching. Um, one thing that's interesting about those letters is, is how much you see an integration of Greco-Roman uh, philosophy and teaching, and it becomes interwoven with these inherited uh, stories of, of um, Jesus and Jewish tradition and Jewish teaching kind of interwoven this with Greco-Roman philosophy to, to become the foundation of what we um, know as, as Christian theology. Um, so it's this beautiful interweaving of different uh, traditions to try to make sense of who Jesus was and, and, and how we are to follow him. Um, and it's reflective of the way that it begins to spread um, throughout uh, different parts of that region and eventually throughout uh, the world. So there's this expansion both in thought and in geographical impact. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of the, the you know, five-minute, ten-minute overview of what's in there, written over thousands and thousands of years uh, by all uh, manner of people who are, who are um, giving their interpretation of what God is doing in their lives and in their communities. Um, so, we, you know, we call uh, Scripture uh, the Word of God, um, but not, not the Word as, as in, like, dictated word for word, you know, like, like we're just automatons writing down what God says, but, but the Word of God as it is understood and experienced and lived um, in, in the lives of people. So it's the Word of God through the lens of people throughout history. Um, you know, there's a phrase in the, in the ordination service when, when uh, ordinands are asked to, to affirm that, uh, that Scripture contains all things necessary to salvation. Um, and I had to think kind of hard about that um, when I was ordained. Um, and I think many, many clergy do. Um, because, you know, I, I, I grew up wary of, uh, of the idea of an inerrant uh, uh, form of Scripture, like, like the literal word that it, that, uh, of God that, that, um, that can never be questioned and, and was kind of literally dictated. Um, and of course, the, the concept of an inerrant scripture is a pretty new one um, that was developed uh, because the church needed to maintain its authority um, and its, its teaching in the light of um, institutions like slavery uh, that, that were in, in contradiction to aspects of, of that kind of moral teaching and, and scripture. So it needed to say, well, um, you know, this, this command of, of, of God in, in here that seemingly justifies slavery, you know, that's, that's inerrant and that cannot be questioned. Um, so that's a new concept and doesn't really make sense when you really dig into Scripture. Um, but how, so how was I able to answer that question in the ordination service? Well, I see, um, I see... I see scripture as the story of God's love for us, God's engagement and yearning and desire to be uh, with us in communion with us 
And that is the story of our salvation. It's a story of our salvation, not just in terms of eternal life with God, but in terms of how we find life and joy and meaning today, now. Um, so there's salvation in the sense of the present moment and the future. Um, and I do believe that the stories of Scripture are, are um, an essential part and a necessary part of our experience of God's love. Um, these are the stories that we inherited, and they are living stories. You know, this is a text that remains alive into which we are invited to, to read ourselves into the story, to identify with the characters, to, to question and lament and rejoice um, with, with these characters who are experiencing uh, life with God. Um, so we're invited to read ourselves into the story and also to lay the stories onto our lives and our day and our context. And say, what does Scripture have to say to the struggles and, and hopes that we know in our lives and see in the world around us today? Um, so I, I do believe that Scripture is, is an essential foundational aspect of our faith and our salvation and our life together. And I, I look forward to digging into it more with you in the, in the weeks ahead. Amen, and God bless it, uh, all of you today.